All right, guys. Uh, welcome back, Push Kids, to your Unit 8 test review. I uh, got a 52 question test here. Got a lot to cover. Uh, a lot of domestic issues, a lot of uh, foreign issues. So that's how I'm going to divide this. All right, so 1950s, uh, we'll take the foreign issues here. Uh, obviously, this is a world dominated by the Cold War, which essentially begins at the end of World War II. Uh, there's a policy of containment as an official policy. We must contain communism. And there's a fear of the domino theory that one country uh, being infected by communism will uh, allow the, the next country that it borders to fall. And like dominoes, you know, one day it'll be just us against the world. The Truman Doctrine um, is Truman's basically pledge to provide economic assistance to any country in need against communism, any government in need uh, from communist insurgents. The Marshall Plan, of course, was our $13 billion financial package that we sent to Europe, which essentially became uh, just Western European countries <clears throat> because Stalin did not allow Eastern European countries to take the money. Uh, basically a two-fold plan here. Uh, it's to make Europe economically stronger so they can be a market for us, so they can buy goods and so that they can become stronger so that they can better resist uh, communism and become a buffer zone for us. Uh, Korean, uh, the Korean War is a proxy war of the Cold War, uh, meaning it's really about the two ideologies of, of uh, capitalism and democracy and socialism and communism, but America is not going to fight the Soviet Union. In fact, the Korean War is a UN war but about 90% of the troops are American. 50s domestic life. Uh, 50s is very much an age of conformity. It's an age where there is a rise in religion. Uh, the baby boomers, of course, a big part of the 1950s. Uh, a lot of kids being born. You got Levitt and his uh, assembly line suburb homes that he builds. And... Uh, you know, it provides a nice, comfortable living for a lot of middle class people. 50s is very much a rise of the middle class. Uh, rock and roll emerges in this time period. And at first, it's very, very looked down upon. It has its origins in African American streets, popularized by, uh, by uh, Elvis Presley, of course. Brown versus Board of Education, a very important piece of legislation. Uh, it's going to roll back Plessy versus Ferguson of 1896, which said separate but equal. Brown versus Board of Education says separate is inherently unequal, and its purpose is to desegregate the school system. In the mid-1950s, you see the rise of Joseph McCarthy, um, that nobody senator from Wisconsin who becomes a celebrity for a short amount of time by ruining people's lives. Um, he has fake documents that say he has all these communist spies uh, in the State Department. And although there were plenty of spies in the State Department, they were not the ones that he said. And he was basically just making up stuff so that he became important, ruined a lot of people's lives. What is this? Oh, one second. Weird. Okay. All right, so uh, the 50s is dominated by the presidency of Dwight D. Eisenhower and his two terms. Uh, there are a host of foreign issues that are going on while Eisenhower is in office. Uh, you have the infamous U-2 Act incident where the Soviets protest us spying with them, and we say we're going to stop, but we send one more spy plane, and uh, they end up shooting it down and capturing Gary Powers for about 10 years. It's a huge black eye for us. It's an embarrassment. The Suez Canal, um, Egypt under Nasser is nationalizing the Suez Canal. So Israel, Britain, and France go to war with them. But us and the Soviet Union work together to calm this situation down. Sputnik, 1957, uh, the Soviets launch a satellite into space. It's the first time it's been done in human history. It's going to start the space race, and it's going to give us some uh, security issues, some um, you know, we're feeling like we're less now. Fidel Castro takes over Cuba in 1959. He turns to communism. Of course, there's going to be a host of issues with Cuba. Uh, there's going to be the Bay of Pigs invasion. There's going to be the Cuban Missile Crisis. And we're going to have to economically sanction Cuba. And we're stuck with those communists um, on our borders until the 2000s. 
Brinkmanship is an official policy of Eisenhower's administration. It's the willingness to go to the brink of war right up to the line. Um, it's a focus in air power, very much focusing in, in having a great air force. Uh, MAD is mutually assured destruction. It helps keep the balance. Um, we're not going to drop our nukes because if we did, they drop their nukes and then both sides are destroyed. So nobody wins in that, in that uh, situation. Domestically speaking for Eisenhower's administration, uh, he had some accomplishments. His interstate system, uh, of course, was a huge one. It brought a lot of jobs. Its first and primary purpose was for defense, of course, to um, evacuate cities in case of nuclear attack. But uh, we know the enormous impact of the interstate today, travel, jobs, all that good stuff. Uh, in his farewell address, Eisenhower famously uh, railed against the military indus- industrial complex. Uh, the Defense Department and Corporation should not be united because otherwise it may it it means that it's good business for us to be at war. Corporations get fat defense contracts making these weapons, so it would be in their best interest to get richer, richer, richer to have wars. And Eisenhower realizes that, and he warns against it. Come on. Let's try that. Um, 1960s, foreign issues here. Uh, Of course, we have the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, The Soviets have placed nuclear warheads on Cuba. Our satellites have discovered them. We're outraged. We tell them to move them. Uh, They say, hey, you've got missiles in Italy and Turkey. You know, fair is fair. Uh, We get a tense 13-day standoff. Uh, Kennedy issues a quarantine of Cuba and you know luckily cooler heads prevail and uh, the missiles are removed we remove our missiles and agree not to invade Cuba Vietnam uh, 1964 Gulf of Tonkin resolution is so we've been in Vietnam we've had advisors over there we've been behind the scenes over there since uh, the Vietnamese beat the French in 1954 but in the 1960s, it will become an official war. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution is pretty shady. Um, it's not built on a very strong pretense of actually being attacked, our ships uh, being attacked out in the Gulf. Um, but we use it anyway. Although Lyndon B. Johnson is very reluctant to get um, to be in Vietnam, he knows that it's not going to be a very easy war to win. Uh, he does this nonetheless. The Kent State shootings. Um, there were a lot of protests against Vietnam. It was not a popular war whatsoever. Um, many Americans felt like we were not there for the right reasons and that we were doing bad things to uh, civilians in Vietnam. And, you know, you have a protest at Kent State. National Guard sent out. Um, somebody does something. It's sort of like the Boston Massacre. And next thing you know, a couple of students are shot and killed. All right, 60s domestic issues. Uh, There's some really big ones, actually, right? Um, You get the civil rights movement. And uh, there's no unification in the best way to get those civil rights. Martin Luther King Jr. and others, John Lewis, they're following the Gandhi model of nonviolence. They think that that will be uh, the best route for success. Malcolm X, uh, who is a member of the Nation of Islam, he becomes a star. He is not a turn the other cheek kind of guy. He's a, if they hit you, you hit them back harder. Um, encourages a little more aggressive stance on civil rights. Sit ins, freedom rides, economic boycotts were favorite tactics of um, the people who followed nonviolence. And those were a lot of times done by students. Uh, the most, uh, without a doubt, the thing that helped the best was economic boycotts like the Montgomery bus boycott after Rosa Parks uh, was, uh, you know, the big issue with her. All right, Black Panthers and the Nation of Islam are two groups that are more aggressive. Uh, the Black Panthers had like a 10-point plan. They talk about uh, reparations and stuff like that. Um, they're, not, they're not advocating, like, even though they dress like militia and stuff like that, they're not advocating going around killing people. They're just, it's like a preparedness to fight when the time comes. Uh, Nation of Islam, also very aggressive. They end up assassinating Malcolm X because 
Malcolm X becomes more popular than their leader, Elijah Muhammad, and then he kind of breaks from the nation of Islam after he takes his pilgrimage to um, to Mecca. Stonewall Rides, got to remember that. That's in New York. Um, you know, you have a, a favorite uh, gay hangout, and there's a raid on it, and stuff goes down, and, and a couple people are killed, and there, that led to sort of the modern-day gay rights movement. So associate those two together. Uh, Miranda versus Arizona happens in 1966, and that's going to give us your Miranda rights, meaning that police have to tell you why you're being arrested and that you have the right to remain silent and you have the right to counsel the things you see in the movies all the time now. Uh, that's going to happen in 1966. All right. Uh, women's rights. Also, it's been around for a while, but it kicks up steam, as you can imagine, because the civil rights is kicking up steam. You get the National Organization of Women, or NOW, uh, and their big focus is to challenge sexual discrimination in jobs. Uh, basically, uh, we don't, you know, we're not looking for women lawyers. We're not looking for women doctors. You know, that's sexual discrimination, not hiring somebody because they're a girl. Counterculture is against the 1950s conformity. Um, you get groups like the Beatniks. Uh, you get uh, utopian communities on the coastlines that, you know, the hippies basically that espouse free love, you know, because marriage is conformity. If you are married, straight man, straight woman, then that's conformity. So free love is like, no, nah, we don't worry about these labels and stuff like that. Uh, so counterculture. LBJ, the original before LeBron James, um, his big plan and enormously impactful is the Great Society. Um, LBJ was a Texan politician who was a former teacher. And he wanted to make a huge change. He wanted to declare, and he did declare, war on poverty, which is really big rhetoric. Poverty is not really something you can defeat. At least we haven't seen it in world history. And so he sort of set himself up for a war he couldn't win there. Uh, and LBJ's Great Society is always going to be damaged by the Vietnam War. Like these two are working against each other. He's successful on the home front and then not on the foreign front. And it weakens his great society. But he gives us things like Head Start. Uh, Medicare is a great society program, which is going to provide health insurance for poor people. We still don't get that universal health care. That's not something, you know, it's something that's been talked about. It's not something we're going to get until Obamacare in the 2000s. Um, what the great society is seeking to do is to break the cycle of poverty. And he thinks that that can be done through better educating uh, the people of America and providing them with job training that can get them a job and make them productive members of society. All right, 1970s and 80s, foreign version. Uh, you get uh, Richard Nixon will replace uh, LBJ after his two terms. And Nixon is actually going to, he has some accomplishments, although, of course, you think negative when you think of Nixon. There are some accomplishments. He ends Vietnam War after a couple of years of uh, being in office. And he also, of course, gives us detente with China and lessening of Cold War tensions with China. He recognizes uh, the People's Republic of China as the actual China. And that's a huge deal and, and creates a much better relationship between us and China. Um, so that, that's his big thing. So, of course, we know that that Nixon's going to have the Watergate scandal where he knowingly he knew that people working for him were had broken into the Democratic building and, you know, were digging up files on his, the people running against Nixon. He did some shady stuff. He filmed people in uh, without their knowledge in the White House so he could blackmail them and stuff like that. Uh, so he's actually, Nixon's actually replaced with Gerald Ford, his vice president. Uh, but Gerald Ford won't ever get elected. He just serves out the remainder of Nixon's term. And uh, he's not very popular, a lot of that being because he pardons Nixon. So after Carter, we get Jimmy Carter, or after uh, Gerald Ford, we get Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter is this Georgia governor. He's uh, he's an outsider, Washington outsider, like Ronald Reagan, who would come in after him. Uh, Carter's only going to serve one term. A lot of his is derailed by uh, the Iranian hostage crisis. So you got a U.S. embassy in Iran, and Iran in 1979 goes through a revolution, and they you have a hardline Muslim fundamentalist group who uh, – they take over the American embassy and take 50 Americans hostage, and they're going to have them hostage for 444 days, so over a year. 
that Carter, you know, there's he sends some rescue attempts and those fail and stuff, and it makes him look bad. And luckily for Reagan, Reagan comes in. It's not really because of Reagan, but he gets the credit for it. But the Iranian hostage crisis is solved when Reagan comes in. Um, he too is a Washington outsider. He started off as a uh, as an actor uh, in his younger days. Uh, he actually started off as a Democrat in his younger days and then switched to Republican Party. Uh, he's a big religious guy. He's part of the neocon, neoconservative, uh, far right movement. Um, now, Carter, domestically speaking, Carter also faced a lot of issues. Uh, there was a lot of high inflation going on. There were high interest rates um, during his tenure, increased government spending and unemployment was on the rise. 70s were not a good time economically for America. Uh, you also had the OPEC embargo, which really, really damaged our economy. Um, that, and that was because America was supporting Israel in the Yom Kippur War of 1973. So the, the Arab nations got together and said, we're going to punish you, America. All right, domestically speaking, in the 70s and 80s, uh, you get a woman by the name of Rachel Carson who writes a book, yeah. Silent Spring. It talks about it, it kind of for the first time brings people's attention and focus to uh, the environment. And so the green you get what's known as the green revolution. People are trying to uh, do things to help the environment. Uh, you got Betty Frieden, who's been around for a while. She's 60s, 70s days. Uh, she criticized gender roles, said that middle class wives were unfulfilled, that being a housewife simply wasn't enough for them. And when you surveyed them, when you talked to them, they let you know that they wanted an education, that they wanted to have jobs, that they wanted to have a uh, political voice. As you can imagine, the 1970s and 80s had a lot more divorces because there's more freedom and more independence for women in this time period. Uh, women are working in higher numbers, and so they, you know, men have lost leverage against them. America is grain, which simply means that it's getting older. Uh, there's major distrust of the government by everyday citizens because of the Watergate scandal. Uh, from that time point on, uh, you know, a majority of people don't trust politicians still with us today. There's a conservative backlash against counterculture of the 60s. So the 60s was a backlash against the conformity and religion of the 50s, the 70s and 80s, the late 70s and 80s. It gives you it goes right back to it. A conservative backlash against uh, the liberal movements of the 60s. Uh, the number of women in public office increased. And again, you see the rise of Christian fundamentalism. Right? The, uh, uh, you got to get right with Jesus, got to get back in church, that kind of stuff. Uh, you see a rise in televangelist in the 1980s. At right, the ERA, you got to know that there's the Equal Rights Amendment. It was an amendment that was proposed to be passed to uh, basically guarantee equal rights for women that they can't be discriminated against, can't lose those rights. Um, obviously there were many men against it, but there were also conservative women against it, such as Phyllis Schauffele. She's one of the, uh, the leading voices. Um, equal rights amendment would mean that women would have to be eligible to be drafted just like 18 year old boys. Um, and so there were many women against that. Three mile Island, uh, in 1970s, America was experimenting with nuclear power to create energy. And there was a partial meltdown at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. Um, no one died, um, but it, it did freak people out. There were higher rates of cancer in the areas surrounding Three Mile Island. So uh, from that point on, America sort of moved away from nuclear power. We have far fewer nuclear plants than they do, say, in Europe. All right, guys, that is your test. Covers a good amount of time. It's got a lot of exciting topics, a lot of big deal, a lot of things that um, tie in with the world you live in today. So you need to be making note cards off of this. You need to be uh, plugging this in and understanding the big picture of everything. Okay. All right. Good luck on your test. You got this.